Okay, can we start now? Okay. So, where are we at this point? So, so far we have looked at lots of different types of problem on which a force or a set of force and force and moments applied onto a structure and we could, using equilibrium equation and drawing a free body diagram, find the reaction forces uh, either to the ground or reactions from another structures attached to it. So forces and reactions, equilibrium, free body, that's what we have done so far. So we'll now move on and we will start with a structural form called trusses. And then we'll go into beams, another structural form, behavior of a couple of engineering materials, and then stresses in the beams, deflection of beams, and other things that we'll do. So until here, until the next topic, we would be still deciding or, or discussing how big are my forces, for example. So we will not look at from the structure's point of view. So we will look at, look at what is the effect of those, those forces onto those structures to start with. And the second half, we'll look at can my structure resist the load I am applying. Will it break? Will it deflect too much? Or, or, or it would be durable for that load or not? Now durability will not cover in this uh, uh, year, but primarily can the structure resist the load? So we'll look at from the structure's point of view in the second half of this uh, course. So how big are my forces? Normally we call it the effect of the load. And can my structure resist? It's the resistance. So the effect of the load must be less than the resistance of the structure. Otherwise, it will, it will fail. So, so we look at that aspect that effect of the load is less than the resistance to some extent in the trusses. So still on the first bit. So trusses are the sort of an assembly of compression and tension member. So that means the, the structural member carries the load along their axis. They don't bend, so it's not it's not bending as uh, so. If so, if, if if this is a truss member, you will either pull it or push it. It it not bending, so we, it it is not the bending that we will be considered here. Now, of course, any truss does take certain amount of bending, and they are subjected to. But the primary mode of resisting force is in the axial direction, either in tension or in compression. So either you are putting a pulling force to that one or you are putting a pushing force into the structure. So that requires most uh, trusses are, uh, we assumed as pin joints. So each, uh, so different members are connected to each other by pin joints. And we will assume as before, there is no friction involved, so there are frictionless pin joints. And loads are only acting at joints. Why? Because if it acts in between, then that will bend the member. So bending will come into the picture. Now trusses are very efficient structures. So a lot of different uh, type of structures are made using trusses. So coming from, say, space stations, uh, uh, structures, for example, solar panel in the space station to, to even some parts of the, some of, the, of, of the space rockets also made up of, or the unfolding of it, deployable structures are made up of truss system. Trusses are used in bridges, buildings, part of helicopters, for example, and some parts of even aircraft as well. So for example, the landing gear, for example, is nothing but truss. So, or, or, or an assembly of stresses. So the joint that we talk about is this pin. 
So what it means is this member is free to rotate about that joint. Now, of course, it's not strictly speaking fully free. There will be friction there, but we ignore that. So as I said, it could be, it could be a bridge, and then those are made up of trusses. So in a typical bridge like this, carrying a railway or a highway would be something of a two trusses on two sides, and then it will be, they will be connected by what you call the floor beams, and then you have the floor slabs over those, and that will carry the load, either the railway uh, or, or the highway in these cases. Now, if you look at the joints, we said they are the hinge joint, but if, if one looks closely, they're anything but hinge. So sometimes they're even welded at those, these are called gusset plates. So they are, they, are, they are welded to the gusset plates. But for calculation purposes or analysis purposes, we will assume that these are the joints of so-called hinges. So that means that it, it can rotate, there would be, could be a relative rotations between the members connected at a joint. Say, for example, if you, if you consider this joint, the members are 90 degree to each other. Now, if I apply load, then this joint may not be 90 degree, or this joint may not be 90 degree. And that resistance to rotation, either increased or decreased, will be zero, because there is no moment acts on those joints. But in actual structures, they do. But we idealized as those hinged connections. So, as I was saying, this is hardly ping. You cannot notice any ping here. These are completely welded, those members, into, into the beams there. And, 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 and we still assume these are the ping structure. And the load applied at the nodes, in some cases, yes, but not really, because sometimes it could be that this truss could take load from the in-between points as well. Now, if you, if there are, the trusses are everywhere, really. So if you go into a supermarket, and if you look up, you'll see the trusses act as a beam. So whenever there is a huge span, then you, people use trusses, because they are highly efficient uh, structural form, because they carry the load in the axial direction, rather than bend, bend to take that load. As I mentioned, a helicopter, Again, assemblage of trusses, you could see on the tail. Slightly much more close up view for another, another image from another doctor here. You could see the main structural system starting from the, starting from the wheel base to the main structure to the, to the tail. Everything is sort of made up of truss assembly. Now, these are slightly different than the bridge trusses because these are sort of 3D truss system here, but principle is absolutely the same. If you look at under the bridges again, you could see a bit of truss there. Now, we do, a, so this biplane uh, photo is from the Manchester Science and Industry Museum. So they have got an airspace, and, and it's in there. So you could see between the two level of the wing here, you have got members of truss connected. Now there are two types of members. I don't know whether you can see, you can probably see the clearly the black one, and then also you can see some cables. Now the cables are another form of truss member which can only take a pull force because cable is, is sort of a, if you put a push force, then it just buckles or it just cannot take that. But cable can take a pull force. So those cables are sort of a tension member, so they can take the pull. Whereas these bars can take the compression as well as tension. So you could have a truss system like this, for example. So on this side, you have got these members, and this is nothing but a truss. And then another truss at the back, and then possibly you have got this cable shown with the orange color, those are the tension members. So one could analyze this 
of the load carrying capacity of this bike plane by just by these truss systems in that sense, the main one. So you have noticed that when you talk about trusses, we often talk about triangles. They're made up of lots of series of triangles. You may say, why triangles? Why not another form? Why not pentagon, hexagon, or even square, for example? Now, triangle has got certain advantages because if it is a triangular form, then if you apply a load, say, let's say, at one joint, then that will actually import the load onto the structure rather than being a mechanism. So these structures extend. So whenever something extends or contracts, then that means it is carrying the load that you are applying. So this way it is, it is, it is carrying the load. But compare a rectangular one. So the rectangular one, if you apply that load at the top, then what will happen? It will just slide on in the horizontal direction, like a, like a mechanism. So it will not carry the load. So, so this is something called a mechanism, whereas this is a structural form. So to make that load, to carry this load, you probably need to add another member diagonally, either here or here, it doesn't matter. And you, you could see if the member was between these two points along this diagonal, then that would be under compression, so that would be squeezed. So then that will take the load, that will resist this movement. And if that diagonal member is along this one, this would be extending for this load. So it will resist this yellow load or the load from the side by extending. So you need structural structures to deform, structures to deflect to carry the load as well. Okay. However small it, it could be. A mechanism, in this case, the bottom picture does not carry that load. It simply goes into a motion or a movement. So that's the basic principle in terms of the triangle and they're very efficient as well. So any shape with more than three sides with a hinge connections produces mechanism. Now you may say, okay, I have seen structures with four members or three members, like a, uh, like a, like a square or a rectangle, but in those cases, these joints are not pinned. The joints have got more like a resistance to rotation. Then it is possible. Then any other form like a pentagon, hexagon, other, other forms are possible. But if the joints are pinned or hinged, then the triangle is the very basic one that you need to develop. And that's why you will see with lots of examples, they are based on this triangulated structure. And if you want to depart from that, you have to make those joint as moment resisting, non hinging So, so that, that's the thing that I said. So if you can replace those joints with a fixed joint, then it, yes, it will carry those loads. And then that will bend. Each of these member will bend in this way. So loads in these cases are carried by bending and not in the axial direction, not by pull or push. So this is a frame. We call it not a truss anymore. We call it a frame. And, and you'll see lots of uh, examples of these frames if you walk around. Like this, for example, an warehouse. So these are made up of, so how many sides? One, two, three, four, five sides. And, and, and main thing is to consider that the joints are not hinged. So they are the thick joints and they can ca carry moment. So you could have other forms, but you need to ensure that joints are rigid. So that's sort of a fixed angle, not a pin. This is a photograph of MIB building just uh, next door, the other side of Western Hall. And if you look at outside, again, these trusses are provided. And this takes the load in the lateral direction. So for example, wind or a ground movement occurs in these directions. 
so the walls are not strongly resistant to take that forces, the lateral load from the wind or now some of the columns inside the building can take certain amount but may not be sufficient. So these trusses, architects use it because they are very efficient and they could be designed very well so that it could blend with the structures. In this case it did. And these can take the forces from the sides. And you will see many cases, many big buildings, they use system of trusses to carry uh, the lateral loads. So this is the truss in this case, for example. If you are here in Manchester, you know, and if you are not from Manchester, still probably you know. What is this one? Yes? This is one of those large satellite dishes. Not satellite dishes. Can you be more specific? One of those large, one of those, those large telescopes. Radio telescope, that's right. Do you know, where is it? Yeah, radio telescope. And I can even see trusses throughout the entire building. Exactly, and you can visit this structure. This is something called Jodrell Bank. So this is the Man University of Manchester Astronomy uh, Department's, uh, Physics and Astronomy Department's uh, facilities. So it's in Cheshire. So you could go and visit there and, 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 and see this huge structure. So, uh, and, and when it rotates to track certain signal, then these, these have got a rails at the bottom, and then the whole, whole telescope antenna can rotate and point towards certain part of the sky, for example. But this is again made up of assemblage of trusses. So you need to go there and see the scale of it to see. And, and, and the very fact that a radio telescope has to be very precise, they need to be very stiff so that the disc of the antenna doesn't deflect too much even when in the different configurations, so upright, sideways, for example, they should not, they should have, they should be very stiff. So truss system provides that stiffness, let alone the strength that you, you need to provide. So visit that sometimes, so maybe not in winter, but maybe summer time. Anybody has gone to George Rilvan here? Yeah, you have, okay, good. So did you see it moving? Not here, there. Okay. So I went there once inside that bowl. So that was quite an experience because they had some issues with the tracks. So this is made up of metals, which was from the Second World War gun six, for example. So what they did is about that was about 15 years back. They changed their put in, put in new set of motors to run those uh, run those along the wheels rails at the bottom. And that was with a higher acceleration and they saw those wheels are failing. This is called a Lovell telescope. So the person who, who uh, was behind this one, a professor in the University of Manchester. So he was there. So we were trying to give them some structural insight why this is failing if they have increased these uh, accelerations. So it's something called stress waves and with, with the material testing that, that was the case. Okay. So you could see all the other type of assembly of structure as well, the beams, trusses, and the cables as well. And then sometimes the trusses are hidden. So if you go to, for example, uh, Manchester United Stadium in Old Trafford or the City Stadium, they have got this tie bar system or a truss system to take the loads, but they are hidden in a way that that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, block the view, for example, or the clear access. In this case, this is a terminal building in in Paris, I think, and you have got these huge trusses on the outside to take the load from the roof. So, how do we analyze these structures? I Means, of course, we need to know the loads. But how do we know whether these loads are, 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 could cause the collapse of the structures or not? How do we know how much load percentage is getting into each of these members? So there are two methods broadly. First one is called method of joints. So this is useful when member, all member forces are needed. 
and we use each joint one by one, draw the free body diagram and find the member forces using equilibrium direction. And sometimes you come with different types of problems that you can solve and so you cannot solve. So as you mentioned before, this is a mechanism, this is not a structure, so too few members, you cannot solve those. This is the right level number of members and their connections, so this is something called a determinate truss. I'll be using the term determinate or indeterminate. Determinate means the problems that you can solve using equilibrium equations. Now this is, this is a truss in terms of a structure, it's fine, but you cannot solve it using equilibrium alone. It has got more members than needed. We will not unfortunately be able to do this one this year. You will do that in the second year called indeterminate structure. Indeterminate means that you cannot solve them by equilibrium equation only. You have to think about other things. So the problem three in, in the first, uh, second weeks of lecture. Then the other method is called method of sections and I am going to illustrate that rather than reading it from here with a problem. Uh, again, uh, other examples are there, transmission tower. A few years back, uh, institution of uh, electrical engineers uh, went in to look at different ways that this transmission tower could be, could be conceived. For example, they're primarily now the assemblies of trusses. So various ideas came up, but all those started from those basic truss type of structural form, and this is still much more efficient than any other forms that is the bending. You could still see some of the other forms, but they're not as efficient in terms of the material use uh, as the truss structures. Of course, the famous fourth rail bridge in Edinburgh, nothing but Blaze of trusses. Okay, so that's what in terms of the introduction to the trusses that I wanted to give you. Next, I'm going to quickly go through the lecture notes that is uploaded in Blackboard, and I'll go through what is in there, and then I'll look at one or two problems, for example, to see that. So the, this one has got, we are talking at axial members. Now, Imagine you have got a bar like this and you are pulling it with a force in this direction. The question is how much of that force is inside the member? So if, if what is the force in here? So if you put that load in one end, how much is the force inside in here? So how do we find it? Now the way the engineers find these forces or later you will find the stresses as well. You find that you, you assume yourself within the structure in a way, by, by, and, but how do you do it from the theoretical point of view? You think, okay, what I can do is, this is my stress member here, which I'm pulling by a 10 kilonewton force. I take a piece of a pair of scissors, I u I'll use these scissors very well, so just on the free body diagram in the first lecture. So you cut at one point, a cut means a virtual cut. So you cut and separate it into two parts. So this beam, beca this bar becomes two bars, one which is connected to the support and one is sort of a free attached with the load. Now if you consider this bar, which you have cut, question is, what will make this bar in equilibrium? Because this part, the load put in the original structure is in equilibrium. So if a structure is in equilibrium, in each and every part of it is into equilibrium. So if we separate it out and draw the free body diagram of this part, then that must be balanced on the other end by an equal and opposite force. So the force within the structure must be 
the same 10 kilonewton. Difference between this 10 kilonewton and F, F is inside the structures. It's the internal force. So this F is the internal force, internal within the structure. Whereas 10 kilonewton, you applied a load from here. Maybe you hang 10 kilonewton worth of a weight, for example, onto, onto the other side. So these are external load and this F is internal. So the structure within it would carry that amount of load. So if this is in this direction, that has to be under tension. Now where does that one go? Now of course, that is a reaction force coming from the other side of the structure. So then it would be in the same way going on the opposite direction. If this was compressive, sort of a pushing rather than pulling the member, then this would be also compressive. So you'd see that the structure, each part of it, is under compression or tension depending on the load that you apply. So if you are pulling, each and every part, if you isolate them, they will be under that pulling force. Okay? So this is something you need to have to visualize it that, or, or, or get into conceptually uh, in, in, in your head that tension in one end create tension in each and every part of the st structure. Compressions from that one end by a force create compression in each and every part of the structure. So if you isolate a part, then that is under a push type of force from two sides. If it is under tension, each and every part of that stress member is under a pull force. Okay, so how do we solve this? So this is an example shown in step-by-step -step way. Again, in the lecture notes, through all the explanations given, I hope you can... By the way, is the lecture notes okay, first part? Have you had a look at that? Is that okay? Understandable? Not too much jargon or anything? No? Okay? Good. So if you, if you do have problem in... Because these are notes are under development anyway, so... If you find some parts are not very well explained, do let me know. Either I'll update that or put a supplementary video to, for your understanding. Okay, so how we are going to analyze this truss? So we have got this particular truss. All members are one meter, so AC, AB, BC, CD, all one meter. So that means it's equilateral, three equilateral triangles making up these trusses, this truss. So each angle is 60 degrees and it is supported by a pin joint to the ground at A and a roller joint at E to the ground and it carries a 15 kilonewton horizontal force to the right at point B. So what do you want to know? How much, first of all, you have to find out how that 15 kilonewton load is actually going into the ground. So what would be the reaction force I'd be required from the ground? And in doing so, because any load you apply on top of a structure or part of a structure ultimately has to go through the support to either to another structure or to the ground, finally, for the rest. Now, first of all, we need to find out that. And once we have found out that, the question is then, how does each and every member of this truss contribute to it? Do they take, is this the most critical? Is this the highly loaded? Or is this the highly loaded? Is this in tension or is this in compression, for example? So what type of load that each of these members would experience? Push type or pull type? Compression or tension? And how much is the quantity? That's the whole point of this truss analysis. So let's, let's move, it, uh, move on to it uh, step by step. So the first thing, we'll uh, find out how much is the ground reaction forces. So for that, we draw a free body diagram for the whole truss. So we strip off the supports. So this is a pin, and as we said before, pin means possibility of two reaction force, horizontal and vertical. Let's say that is HA and VA. Roller means only one reaction force, vertical, so VE. So using the equilibrium equation that you have learned, you can find out what would be these three forces, three reaction forces. Now, if you do summation of horizontal forces zero, that's an equilibrium equation. 
you will get H A plus 15 kilo Newton. Those are the two forces is zero. So that will give you H is H A is minus 15 kilo Newton. So that will also tell you that minus means that my assumed direction for H A was from left to right. So that means it actually goes from right to left. So the ground reaction force at point A in the horizontal direction goes from right to left of 15 kilo Newton magnitude. Next you need to find out V A and V E. So best way to do that is if you take moment about point A, then these two mo uh, uh, forces would give zero moment because it is passing through that point. So only left is V E and 15. So 15 kilonewton force will create a moment 15 times this vertical distance. So if this is one meter, A, B is one meter, and this angle is 60 degree, so the vertical distance is the moment uh, arm for this 15 kilonewton is one, uh, one sine 60 or one cosine 30. So I, both the same. So 15 times one sine 30 or 1 cosine 30 would be moment due to 15 kilonewton, And that would be a clockwise moment about point A. That must be registered by V at a 2 meter distance. So minus V over 2 equal to 0. So V gives you 6.5 kilonewton. Now we can apply, so V comes with a positive sign, that means this direction that I have assumed is right. So what about V A? Now, summation of vertical forces zero would give me VA is minus 6.5 kilonewton. So that means it goes from uh, up to downward. It's a downward force. So we have now calculated the ground reaction force, HA going from right to left, 15 kilonewton, VA from a downward force of 6.5 kilonewton, and VE is an upward force of 6.5 kilonewton. So these loads are the, uh, these reaction forces are, are from the ground. So now the question is, we have got these seven members in this truss, how much, so of the each member are carrying this force. For example, 15 kilonewton is a, when it is going to the ground, it causes the reaction force from ground of these three forces. But in process of doing that, how much forces are getting into each of these members? So for that, we have to get into details of each of these members and draw the free body diagrams. Now, you, there are two methods, as I said. First is method of so-called joints and method of section. So first, I will we'll, we'll do it by method of joints. Again, we'll bring out our pair of virtual scissors and cut a joint. As soon as you cut it, then you have to replace it with a possibility of forces at those cut locations. And then we'll try to satisfy what force would make that part, the cut part, under equilibrium. In the same way, we did it into this simple problem. We make a cut, and then we replace by, uh, we put a possibility of a force, and we are asking what force will make that the isolated part under equilibrium or what sort of a system of force. So that gives us, and that we calculate by equilibrium equations. So exactly the same thing we'll be doing. So if we make a virtual cut around point A, so isolate point A, so I have to make two cuts, one here and one there. So if I do that cut, now of course, then there is a possibility of a force FAB in that direction and FAC in this direction. I am assuming they are sort of a pull type of force, a tension force. You can, could do in the opposite way, because then if your, if your assumption is right, you'll come up with a positive value. And if you come up with a negative one, then that means please change your direction, initial direction. So we know the ground reaction is 15 kilonewton, but in this, it is in the opposite direction, so it's a minus 15. If you did put the direction of the arrow right to left, then you could use that as a plus sign. So be careful with that. 
So not both. So you can show the direction of the force, but then choose the sign accordingly. If you had chosen this arrow sign going from right to left, that would be plus 15. Similarly, if you see this one is downward force, then you could put as plus 6.5. Now you, you are putting it still as upward force as before, and we know that value is minus 6.5. So I'm sticking with that. And this FAB and FAC, I'm assuming these are sort of a pull type of force. Now, what do we have now? How do we find out the forces in these two members? We'll use equilibrium equations. So if you use the, resolve the forces vertically, so this FAB has got a vertical component. So then the component would be FAB sine 60 or cosine 30. This angle is 60. So I don't know why I'm using cosine. It should be sine 60 would be fine. But sine 60 cosine 30 is the same thing. So this angle is 30. So if AB cosine 30 upward and 6.5 with a negative sign upward is equal to zero because this minus 15 kilonewton and FAC does not have any vertical component. So that gives me FAB is 7.5 kilonewton and it comes with a positive sign. So that means it is on, uh, in, as per my assumed direction, it's a pull force, it's a tension force. And if you resolve the forces in horizontal direction, so you have got no component from this 6.5, so you have got minus 15, and then you have got FAB's horizontal component, which is cosine 60, plus FAC equal to zero, and this gives you Again, 11.25 kilonewton tension. Just one thing to note here, if you did this in the other way around, if you did horizontal equilibrium equation first, then that would involve two unknowns. FAB cos 60 plus FAC sine 60. You couldn't have solved that step at all. You needed to do the vertical one first, uh, vertical one then, and then putting it back. So while doing this calculation, think about the order in which it will, you can get the forces in one of the members uniquely. So rather than solving, otherwise it's fine, you'll get simultaneous equation and you solve that. So try to resolve the forces in the directions that will give you the forces with, uh, without solving a simultaneous set of simultaneous equations or change the order by which you will do those equilibrium equations. Now this will come with the practice and you'll soon get over that, uh, get through that. Okay, so that's for joint A. So member AB has got a tension force of 7.5 kilonewton and member AC has got a tension force of 11.25 kilonewton. What does this mean? FAB is under 7.5 kilonewton. If I go back to the truss, that means this member AB for the whole length, and I repeat, for the whole length, it is under a force of 7.5 kilonewton. So each part, if you isolate, that would be subjected to a 7.5 kilonewton pull force on the two sides. So each part, so if you take isolate a part here, isolate a part near the joint, or in the other joint, it is under a pull type of forces of 7.5 kilonewton. So that means if, if this whole force is, uh, if this whole bar is under 7.5 kilonewton, when you are coming to analyze this joint at B, then you could consider, okay, I have analyzed this bar at joint A and I found out this bar takes 7.5 kilonewton force. So when I'm analyzing joint B, I know what this tension is at this point. So that gives you the, the forces at that particular joint. So when you go to joint B, in for, for member AB, you put 7.5 kilonewton because you have analyzed that in the just the step before. So it's, it's from the previous step, so it's all along the whole member and you put it in the tension side. So you are, you are just pulling that load. Now of course at joint B, if we make a cut, 
we have to make three cuts, one at AB, one at BC, one at BD, to isolate that joint. So, so if you do, you will get two other forces, FBD and FBC, and again using the equilibrium equations for, for these ones. Now, of course, again, if you do the vertical one first, you'll get FBC. And once you get FBC, you do FBD by doing the horizontal force equilibrium, and you get those two forces. And you see now, FBC is under compression, minus 7.5 kilonewton, and so is FBD. So these two members would be taking 7.5 kilonewton force, but under push type of force, under compression. And that also means anywhere along that member, it is 7.5 kilonewton push type of force. Anywhere along this member, it's 7.5 kilonewton push. Whereas anywhere along this member is whatever, 11.25 kilonewton pull force or tension force. So you move from one joint to another. So you, when you've done this joint, you know the force in these two members. Once you know, you jo analyze this joint, this is known, so you can find out the other two. And again, once you know these two, then that means you know that force here, that force here, so you can now analyze this joint. Once you know this joint, for example, then you know member forces here and here, and this one, for example, you can find just for E. So going from one uh, joint to the another, you can analyze the whole structure. And this is called something called method of joints. And it, it, it requires you to go from one step to another, one point at a time. Now, there could be some problems where you are asked, I don't want to know all the member forces. I want to know how much force is in BD, for example. Now, using this method that I have just told you, you cannot get directly BD. You had to find, either you have to come from a known point where there are only two unknown forces. For example, either this point or that point. Because there you have got two unknown force mem member force and one known. So you could either come from E to D and then can find out what is BD. Or you can first A and then go into B and find that out. Now, it's fine for this one, but imagine this structure is like the fourth railway bridge or, or something much bigger, and you want to know, you are, you are an engineer, you went there in an inspection, and you saw some part of the truss is corroded, for example, and you want to see how much load possibly it is coming into this member. You don't want to do those hundreds of joints, one after another, to reach in the middle of the truss, that's where the second method, method of section, comes. So what you do is, instead of cutting just a member around a joint, you cut through the structure. So you can, you can have a virtual cut here, here, and here. Now that makes the structure into two parts, and wherever you have cut, you replace, put a force, reaction force, equal and opposite, that may be acting at those points, and then carry out the equilibrium uh, equation. So this is called method of section. So exactly that's what you can do. So you can, you can put a virtual cut through the middle and then that will expose these three members. And once they are exposed, you put all three forces into there. And then of course, you know, then you can use your friend equilibrium equations to resolve these three forces. And, and also you have got uh, moment equations as well to get get all those three unknown reaction forces. Now once you cut it, be uh, sure to not to cut so that it would make more than three uh, uh, unknown reaction forces, unknown member forces. Because you have got only three equilibrium equations, summation of horizontal force zero, vertical force zero, moment about a point is zero. So you can only get three unknown member forces. So again, resolving this, you can quickly find out what would be the member forces in these three. If you're interested in just that one, you could possibly do it by using uh, the summation of particle, uh, sum by taking a moment about a, about a point possibly. So, or, or this one probably, if you take a moment about this point, you can get FSC directly. 
and then you could use the summation of horizontal force zero. So you could, you could get, you could employ various techniques here to get those forces. And finally, finally, the cuts that I have made here, it looks almost as a cut has to be along a straight line. No, you could make a cut like that, for example. Because this, this, this whole point of cut is you are isolating a part of the structure and wherever you have made it a cut means taking it up. Apart from the rest of the structure, you put a force which may be acting at the point of cut. So the cut doesn't have to be along a straight line. It could be a carved line, for example. I could make a cut here, 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 and here. So isolate this bit, for example. I could do that if I, if I need to. So those are the two methods, primarily. There is also another quick point that I need to mention it here. So if you've got a truss system like this. Now, if you consider equilibrium of point B, so that means you do a virtual cut at point B. <laughs> so if I do a virtual cut at point B, so, so those are the points over there. Now, if I do cut point B, for example, with a virtual cut, like that. So these are the two parts of the member. So as soon as I made that virtual cut, I have to put two forces there. So let's say this is the, these are the internal forces. Let's say force from F B to A, and this is the force uh, from B to C. So these F, B, A and F, B, C are the internal force. So these two are internal forces. Okay. Now if I do the equilibrium of these two forces, so if I do summation of horizontal forces zero. So these are the only two forces. So this will quickly give me F, B, A equal to zero. And if I do summation of vertical forces zero, that will give me F B C equal to zero. So look out in a truss for a locations where you have got you have got this ninety degree angle and without any load acting on them. So if you have got a ninety degree joint and you don't have uh, or, or, or two members acting at a point and no other loads acting at that point. Doesn't have to be also 90 degree to some extent. So if you've got two points are acting there, then, uh, then there is a possibility of zero force and it will be definitely be 90 degree, uh, zero forces if, if two members act a joint at a, at, at a joint at 90 degree angle because there would be no uh, component from one to the another. So for example, FBA will not have any component in the FBC directions and vice versa. So they would be the so-called zero force members. Now, somebody can now quickly ask that if that is not taking any force, BA and BC, AB and BC are not taking any force. So this force is passed to the ground primarily through these three members. So why do you need B and C, these two members, for example? Now, zero force member may be for this force. Now, what about if a force acts over here, particularly downward? Then you, it, it, this would be, have forces as well. So look at those and some other problems in here. So go through that piece of lecture notes and then there is this there is this tutorial questions here. Again, extension of just the problem that I have gone through with different forces and different dimensions and and, and some other little bit tricky questions in the end. So do that and I will discuss about the 
uh, your your next uh, sort of online test possibly next week. I'll give you the details on Thursday. Okay. Thank you. I'm coming to you. Just one second. Only week four. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, can I just ask a really quick question? Yeah, yeah. So, when you were saying about the support beams, it's not like a straight line, and the force you say was equal along the whole straight line. So, say if it was like 10 kilonewtons that way, 10 that way, would there not be a force, would there not be a, a place in the middle that's zero, you know, where it transitions from that no, way to no, that no. way? No, 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 that's a, that, that's it's a hard good to question. Sort of yeah, that. yeah. So, so, if you have got this is a 10 kN, you can put it that way and this way. Yeah. If you take out any part from here, yeah. isolate it, then...